This year is the 25th anniversary of the launch of NASA's near Shoemaker space mission, the first dedicated mission to an asteroid. And in the last quarter of a century, we've seen a string of other missions to asteroids, and there's no sign of that interest drying up, as there's at least five new missions planned in the next three years. These days, images and data about asteroids is everywhere, but that wasn't always the case. The first close-up images of asteroids were taken in 1991 and 1993 during the Galileo mission's journey through the asteroid belt to reach its destination of Jupiter. And these images fueled scientists with myriad questions about asteroid orbits, the compositions, their interior structures, and their role in the formation of our solar system. In 1996, NASA launched its first ever dedicated asteroid mission, Near Shoemaker. Near would visit two asteroids, Matilda and Eros, providing us with a treasure trove of information. And today, I'm joined by a man who's not only seen the span of that asteroid research take place, but he's been instrumental in making it happen. In 1997, Andrew Chang was a project scientist for the Near Shoemaker mission, and today he's the chief scientist for planetary defense at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, and the lead investigator for the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, mission. Andy, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Now, back when uh, you were launching Near in 1996, um, a young man, what did yes. we long time ago yeah what do we know about the sort of the asteroids then and and specifically their orbits and how did you choose your targets well eros was chosen because it was one of the largest near earth asteroids known as the second largest at the time it comes close to earth and the, and it was just supremely interesting for both of those reasons and as you said we had uh, we were just tantalized by the glimpses of these were main belt asteroids, Gaspar and Ida, that were seen by Galileo. And we didn't know if the near Earth asteroids would look the same. We had no idea what, what, what we would find when um, we actually got up close and studied them for the first time. What did we think about the differences in the in the orbits and how they had got into sort of their near Earth asteroid orbits and come from the belt? What did we know about it then? Okay, at the time, um, in fact, one of the major forces that uh, causes main belt asteroids to leave the main belt and eventually come in close to the um, near Earth region to become near Earth asteroids. One of the two main reasons why that happens was not even fully appreciated, was not understood at all at the time. So that was the more recent advance in our understanding and that is the uh, Yarkovsky force or it's the force, of, it's a radiation caused by the uneven heating of the asteroid surface by the sun and the re-radiation of this energy back into the space is also uneven and that causes the asteroid orbits to change. So that's one of the reasons why uh, asteroids go into the near Earth region. The other one is a complicated set of, it's, it's the many body interactions with the, with the major planets they call, causing what we call secular perturbations of the orbit. And that also causes asteroids to drift into, drift out of the main belt and into the near Earth region. But asteroids, as you say, in the near-Earth region don't stay there very long. They only live in the as near-Earth asteroids for tens of millions of years. And they fall into the sun or they're ejected from the solar system out past Jupiter or they hit the Earth. So we don't like the latter. That's, we don't want that to happen. No, right. absolutely, absolutely not. It's quite amazing, isn't it, how dynamic um, the asteroids are really and in, in their movements. When you launched uh, NEAR, were any of its investigations geared towards trying to understand some of that? Or did that come out of your data, for example? We were trying to understand, yes. We wanted, NEAR was about trying to understand how the asteroids were put together and also what they were made of. So we had measurements of the composition and we had many studies of what the surface looked like 
and what it's, how its interior was put together. So measuring the density, measuring the gravity fields, measuring chemical, elemental, and mineralogical composition of the body. Mm. It's absolutely a fascinating mission. So thank you so much, Andy, for telling us uh, about um, this initial look at Near Shoemaker. We're going to keep coming back to you throughout the Asteroid Day Live broadcast to get updates about how Near contributed to all the many facets of asteroid science um, that we talk about today. But for the moment, Andy, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm back with Andy Chang, the lead investigator for NASA's DART mission and the former project scientist for the world's first ever dedicated asteroid mission near Shoemaker, which celebrates its 25th launch anniversary this year. Andy, let's wind the clock back for a moment to before the launch of NEAR and give us a picture of what we knew about the makeup of asteroids back then. We had big questions about, about the nature of the asteroids. Um, one, of the large, one, one of these questions was the connection between asteroids and meteoroids. The most common meteoroids, these are rocks that fall onto Earth from space. We now understand they are pieces of asteroids. But that in itself was, was, was puzzling. What was puzzling about it was that the most common asteroids and that we see in telescopes and the most common meteorites whose composition we measure after they fall on the earth, they did not seem to match. And so how, how is that possible? And, one of the, and, and we now understand after, after near that the compositions actually do match, but they don't look that way. The surfaces of these rocks, these min minerals are altered by exposure to space radiation. So they look different in telescopes than what we had realized. And, but the elemental composition matches and we have also since near returned samples from a number of the same kind of stony asteroids, the S type asteroids. And in fact, confirmed that the compositions do match with the most common meteorites. So that's a mystery solved. What, um, what's the difference in the, the, the range of differences in the compositions of the asteroids? Because they come in many different types, don't they? Asteroids come in many different types. And actually, if you just think back to all the different types of materials and rocks you find on a planet like the Earth, how many different kinds? In the asteroid belt also, you find a similarly large diversity of materials, some of which came from the surfaces are, are similar to the materials you find on the surfaces of a planet. Others are similar to what you find in the deeper layers or even in the core of a planet. And so that's that full diversity. And of the surface materials, um, some asteroids have a lot of water in them. They have clays. Uh, they have minerals that have been altered by contact with liquid water. And um, those are very common. These are so there's a tremendous diversity. Some asteroids are, 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 are carbonaceous. So they're dark and they have a lot of organic materials on the surface. And others are rocky, like the asteroid that um, near visited was a asteroid with a, one of these rocky surfaces. We now understand that surface also was one which was not ever melted. That was one of the big questions also for NEAR was whether the, an asteroid like Eros would be made out of what we call differentiated uh, material. Differentiated means that it melted and it's separated like oil and water separate so that the denser materials, iron rich uh, materials settle into the core of a planet. This happened on Earth, this happened on Mars. Whereas the lighter rocky materials are on the top of, of such a body, a differentiated body. The question is, was Eros part of a differentiated body at one time? And also from near now, we know it was not. It was more mm. primitive type before these materials separate. Absolutely so. fascinating. Yes. Uh, so it's a truly, truly old object dating back yes. billions really of years. Yes. And 
it's not just the launch anniversary this year of Near, is it? It's also yes. the 20th landing anniversary as well, because you actually put your spacecraft down onto the surface of Eros, something that the spacecraft was not designed to do. I'd love to hear a little bit of that story and what, if any, science that you could get out of um, that maneuver. Yes, Near was the first landing on an asteroid. It was something that was, we, we, we decided here at, at APL, Bob Farquhar, who was the mission manager, and I, we decided very early on that we had to land the spacecraft on the asteroid. Um, however, the idea was so terrifying. And <laughs> we were not officially allowed to, to announce that we were going to attempt a landing. In fact, we were not allowed to call it a landing. It was a controlled descent. That was all we were allowed to say. Controlled descent to the surface. And then when we actually landed, <laughs> it, was, it did it. And it, was very, it turned out to be very important for the science that we were able to land the spacecraft because there was a very important measurement with the gamma ray spectrometer that actually could not be made successfully while the spacecraft was in orbit. It turned out that the level of signals that we were receiving from the elements we wanted to measure were not as high as expected. And so in orbit, we were not able to really pin down the composition of the asteroid. But once it went down on the surface, the signals were stronger and we were able to make measurements for a period of two weeks on the surface of the asteroid. And that's what really pinned down the composition. It was a very important sign for science that we were able to land. And of course, for other missions now, they know it's possible to do this. They know how near did it. And, and in fact, very similar methods are, are used by all the other uh, missions that have since landed on asteroids. They've taken samples, they've done surface science, fantastic things. But uh, near was the first to show how to do these proximity operations near an asteroid. And someday, someday we may actually decide to um, try to extract resources from an asteroid. Try to do mining with an asteroid. You do the same, you know, very similar things again. You have to get close mm -hmm. to the surface, descend, put your spacecraft down, and do what you need to do. Fantastic. Great, great achievement and a great mission. So, Andy, thank you very much. I'm here again with Andy Chang, and we heard earlier from him about uh, the characterization of asteroids and what the near Shoemaker mission found when it arrived at Eros and when it landed on the surface. And what's interesting now is how understanding the nature of asteroids is allowing us to plan for maybe deflecting those asteroids if we were to ever find one um, that was a hazard to Earth. Now, for all of those just tuning in, Andy Chang, who's with me now, is the lead investigator for NASA's DART planetary defense mission and the former project scientist for the Near Shoemaker mission. So, Andy, planetary defense seems like a relatively new concept, I think, for many of our viewers. This idea that we could deflect an asteroid that could be on a collision course with Earth. When you were first part of the, the near mission all those years ago, what, if any, thoughts did you have about um, the need for defending Earth from asteroids? Yes, we were very... It turns out that the beginnings of the NEAR mission in the early 90s it was also the time that the asteroid impact hazard first emerged into the consciousness of not just the public, but also really more the scientific community. Or asteroid researchers specializing on the very small, our small community, they have been aware of the asteroid impact hazard for much longer than that, because the evidence, as you, as you mentioned earlier, is very clear. All we need to do is look at the moon. You see the man in the moon, you see all the scars on its surface. Those are all the asteroids that hit the moon from the beginning of its history, continuing now to the present. So we know there is a hazard. And um, as you said also, it will happen. The, 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 the asteroids continue to hit the Earth, <clears throat> but we don't know when the next we don't know when the next impact would be. And this, anyway, this threat 
was first beginning to be more widely appreciated outside the, you know, just the science, the specialized science community in the early 90s. So that was also the time when the NEAR mission developed, the first asteroid, the dedicated asteroid exploration mission, corresponded also to an increase in the interest in exploring asteroids. And then the realization that, oh, this is also a significant natural hazard. And it's unique in that we can maybe actually prevent the next large asteroid impact on Earth. So all that started. And then and subsequently, we had the um, George E. Brown Act. We had Congress actually tasking NASA to discover. <laughs> That's the first step. Find them. <laughs> Find the ones that are out there that are large enough in threatening orbits. Find all these guys. And then also, more recently since then, let's figure out what we can do to save ourselves, how to, pre how to prevent and deal with this threat, how to mitigate this threat. So that's mm -hmm. what DART is. It's the first asteroid mitigation mission. It's a demonstration of how to change the orbit of an asteroid. And mm -hmm. the idea is to do it by a kinetic impactor, which means your spacecraft runs into the asteroid and changes its orbit, just pushes it out of the way. And how have our um, ideas about planetary defense changed in those 25 years from that first sort of recognition uh, of the issue um, to now on the cusp of actually testing a mission with DART? Well, in the early days, there was still something we called the giggle factor. People didn't take it seriously. Like, Are you, you know, it's, it's, they didn't understand. Is this real? Is this for real? Now, I think um, we have progressed to the point people understand, yes, it's for real. And so, yeah, as you say, we're on the cusp of actually launching the DART mission, actually launch in next November. We'll go out and show that we can do this. We can actually change the orbit of an asteroid. Mm. What is the effects do you think are going to happen when you actually hit the moon of Didymos? Just talk me through. Um, imagine, you know, that you were there actually watching this impact um, take place. Um, yeah, give actually, me your imaginations. We will actually have an Italian CubeSat that DART is carrying and that will release before DART actually gets to the asteroid, and that CubeSat will be watching with its cameras as DART hits. So hopefully that, that we will actually be able to see a big splash, flash of light, plume of material coming off, okay? And of course, telescopes on Earth are watching as well. And what they're going to be watching is they cannot, uh, from Earth is so far away, these bodies are so tiny that it's just a point, a single point of light. but. From Earth, what you see, if you're the Earth, you see there's two bodies, it's a binary system. You see them pass in front of each other. And as they pass in front of each other, you know, they block light from each other. Also, they block light from the sun. And so what you see is complicated dips in the brightness of the two bodies combined caused by this orbital motion. And from that, you can measure how fast they go around each other. And that's what we're going to change. When dark hits, the moon it changes the orbit period and so how much do you think you're going to change it by how much do you think you're going to change 10 by? minutes the orbit period now is 11.9 hours we're changing it by you think we don't know how much exactly we think about 10 minutes and that's actually one of the most important measurements that dart will make you measure how much it changed because someday that may be very important because what you want if you have an asteroid coming toward the earth you want to change the orbit enough to make it miss and not put it into another dangerous orbit where it might still hit the Earth. So we have to make sure we get the right amount of deflection. So we want to measure how much deflection we cause by hitting the asteroid. Absolutely. Well, we are all wishing you the very best of luck with that mission. We are all eagerly watching it, and I'm sure that we will uh, invite you back as well so that we can hear what actually happened. Andy, thank you very much. Thank you. Observing and visiting the asteroids of the solar system has provided a whole host of challenges and opportunities for astronomers and engineers and scientists. I'm joined by Andy Chang, who's the lead investigator of NASA's DART planetary defense mission. 
and a former project scientist for the Near Shoemaker mission, our first dedicated mission to an asteroid 25 years ago. Now, Andy, you've seen the evolution of space technology, such as propulsion, communications, and others at first hand whilst working on these missions. And what is it, do you think, that, that makes tracking, characterizing, deflecting asteroids, you know, possible these days? What are these key technologies for you? Well, the, the key technology for DART that allows it to hit the asteroid actually comes from the missile defense world. It's the ability to zoom in, home in on a target autonomously that you see in your camera and be able to hit it. So that's where that comes. Of course, the, the ongoing advances in electronics. So, the, the, you know, the, 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 these guys, <laughs> miniaturization of electronics things that, uh, you know, computers, sensors, everything, much smaller now than they could be um, with NEAR. Uh, for example, the spacecraft electronics were several boxes the size of, you know, as I'm, as I'm trying to show, several boxes that size. On DART, all those functions are in a single box. So because the electronics have been, mm. have been miniaturized, capabilities have just increased, all, you know, all around. Yes. And is that the key technology you would say um, is the miniaturization of the uh, electronics um, or is there, uh, are there others that are equally important? It's that and uh, um, no, I think that actually is, 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 is that everything can be done more integrated and, and smaller, cheaper, and, and also faster now than, than 20, something like 25 years ago, we could not have done the dark mission. It would have been a much more expensive, a very large, much more expensive mission. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you raise the point about um, cost effectiveness in missions, because there are now five fully funded asteroid missions set to launch in the next three years. Um, each of these missions has a different set of scientific objectives. Um, I'm wondering, what the common themes in our asteroid research is uh, these days? Common themes, we always want to discover the, um, what kinds of materials these asteroids are made of. For different purposes, some of them want to explore the early solar system, how planets formed and how these asteroids formed and be looking for the primitive materials. In some cases also, the objective is to as well to, to characterize what resources may, may be found on, on asteroids. And um, another common theme is the study of how the asteroids are put together. What is their internal structure? Are they rubble piles, just pile, loose piles of rock and um, power, uh, we call regolith, so it's, 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 it's powdery material that are just held together by their own gravity mostly and minimal strength, or are they actually strongly, more strongly glued together, if you like, because they're actual rocks? So that's also a big question. We want to know for a number of reasons. One of them is that for planetary defense, it makes a big difference if you're about to be hit by a fluff ball or very loose agglomeration versus a solid rock or, a big, or even a chunk of metal. So that makes a big difference. Um, it also makes a difference to you if you want to mine something, <laughs> whether you're going after a rock or a powder material. So these are the, you know, that's a common theme also to try to uh, understand in asteroid exploration. It's very interesting, isn't it, how all of these ideas about um, what is an asteroid, what's its composition, what's its internal structure, it feeds into all the other um, questions that we may have about asteroids. What role did they play in the origin of the solar system? How could we deflect one? Does it contain resources um, that you know, we might one day want to mine? Now, I've had immense pleasure in talking to you today, Andy. I really have. It's been so fascinating to hear your um, stories about NIA and your look into the future with DART as well. Um, you truly are um, an architect of our understanding of, of asteroids. You really are. 
Um, I want to ask you one question though before we go, and that's I want you to dig deep and tell me what is the one thing that you would love to know about asteroids that we don't already know. And on top of that, if there was one technology that I could magically make happen for you that would allow you to do something with asteroids in outer space, um, what, would, what would that be? Well, the one thing actually that I'm losing the most sleep over because I want to know is how strong these asteroids are. We think they are, they, they, they must be glued together at some level, but maybe really, really weakly. And uh, we've never been able to measure very well how hard it is to pull an asteroid apart. Mm. So that's what I'd like to know the most, yes. So perhaps if I could give you a magical technology then, it would be an asteroid sized centrifuge or something like that, that you could, you yeah. could spin an asteroid and see how much it takes to, uh, to, to pull it apart. Yes. If you can't have that, however, how will we answer your question? Well, it's actually much more complicated because no doubt it depends on what exactly you're trying to do. If you want to dig in it, that'd be one thing because you want to you know, make a hole, you want to extract materials for resources. If you want to push it aside, you want to do that in a way that you don't break it up into other small pieces, okay? That's, that, that, that's maybe a different answer if you do it that way, because it depends on how fast you're trying to push it and also what the scale size is. It's a very complicated question. There's not gonna be a simple answer. So I don't even know if one toy could do it for me. It, it'd be many, many toys. Mm. <laughs> and it's gonna keep you very busy for, yes. uh, for a long time. So yes. Andy, thank you so much for sharing all your insights and your stories with us today. We're so grateful that you joined yes. us.